Hello and welcome to Government with Dr. Turner. Today we're going to describe how the First Amendment protects both church and state, as well as individuals' religious freedom. The founders argued that freedom of religion is valuable because linking religion and government threatens all individual freedom. The founders' support for the freedom of religion was based on keeping politics and religion separate. Their goal was to limit Congress to protect government from religious interference, to protect religion from government interference, and to protect every individual's right to believe. We often hear the phrase, separation of church and state, but no such language can be found in the Bill of Rights. Where did this interpretation come from? James Madison, who wrote most of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, held freedom of conscience in high regard. Likewise, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration of Independence and was elected president in 1800, had no wish to mix religion and government. In 1802, the Danbury Baptist Association wrote President Thomas Jefferson a letter asking why he would not proclaim national days of fasting and thanksgiving like his predecessor, John Adams, did. Here's how he responded. Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declare that their legislature shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thus building a wall of separation between church and state. James Madison wrote in a similar manner, And I have no doubt that every new example will succeed as every past one has done in showing that religion and government will both exist in greater purity the less they are mixed together. Madison also was concerned that religion can divide society into factions, which he viewed as a dangerous threat to the new republic. Our First Amendment freedoms regarding religion are outlined in two different clauses, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. The Establishment Clause states that the federal government will not support an official state church. For example, England used to require membership in the Church of England by law. One reason Texas fought for independence was their dislike of Mexico's proclamation of Catholicism as their official religion. The Supreme Court has considered the Establishment Clause many times in our history. Their decisions can be divided into two perspectives, accommodationist and separationist. Separationists differ from accommodationists in that separationists favor a stricter separation of church and state than accommodationists. Separationists believe that there should always be a strong, impenetrable wall between government and religion. Religions may proliferate, or you could say we could be up to our ears in religions, but they should all remain private. The accommodationist perspective says it is possible to accommodate or make room for religion without giving special preference to one. They say that walls equal intolerance and that we can safely share community values as determined by the majority. In the conflict between accommodationist and separationist views of the Establishment Clause, the Supreme Court generally has leaned towards separation with occasional nods to accommodation. Separationist decisions can be seen in the area of school prayer. If a school prayer is part of official school activities, it violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. When considering instances of possible accommodation of religion by government, the Lemon Test is currently employed by the Supreme Court to determine whether the Establishment Clause has been violated. To pass the Lemon Test, a government-supported religious activity must have a secular legislative purpose. Its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. Finally, it must not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. One example is using government school buses to carry children to Catholic schools. This use is often accommodated because children are required by law to attend school, which is a secular legislative purpose. 
Riding the bus does not advance or inhibit religion. You aren't forced to believe anything to ride a bus. And it does not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. This passes the lemon test, which, by the way, was named for a person and not a fruit. In recent years, states have become more involved in the question of mixing government and religion. They have generally made the issue muddier and more complicated. The Free Exercise Clause promises that citizens can participate in the religious activities of their choice. It brings up the question, when can the state regulate religion? At issue is that we have two things of value. One is religious freedom, and the other is social order and security. Eventually, these two worlds are bound to collide. Early conflicts came about with the introduction of compulsory flag salute laws. In West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett, 1943, the Supreme Court announced that children cannot be required to salute the flag if it violates their religious faith. The West Virginia Board of Education required that the flag salute be part of the program of activities in all public schools. All teachers and pupils were required to honor the flag. Refusal to salute was treated as insubordination and was punishable by expulsion and charges of delinquency. In a 6-3 decision, the court held that compelling public school children to salute the flag was unconstitutional. The court found that such a salute was a form of utterance and was a means of communicating ideas. This established the concept of compelling state interest. In other words, if the state, and normally I mean the government when I say the state, if the state wants to interfere with your religious practices, the burden is on the state to prove there is a compelling state interest to do so. But in 1990, this was rejected by the court in Employment Division v. Smith. The question in this case was, can a state deny unemployment benefits to a worker fired for using illegal drugs for religious purposes? The workers in question had been fired for smoking peyote as part of their Native American religious ceremonies. The court ruled that, yes, they can be denied benefits. Justice Antonin Scalia, writing for the majority, observed that the court has never held that an individual's religious beliefs excuse him from compliance with an otherwise valid law prohibiting conduct that government is free to regulate. Allowing exceptions to every state law or regulation affecting religion would open the prospect of constitutionally required exemptions from civic obligations of almost every conceivable kind. Scalia cited as examples compulsory military service, payment of taxes, vaccination requirements, and child neglect laws. Under Employment Division v. Smith, unintentional infringement by the state on religion is not unconstitutional. According to the court, compelling state interest was an inappropriate standard for religious freedom issues. Now the burden of proof was on the individual or the church to prove that the state had placed an unfair burden on their religious practices. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act, passed by Congress in 1993, was an attempt to give more protection to religious freedoms than the Supreme Court was allowing. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act attempted to restore compelling state interest. The Supreme Court ruled that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was unconstitutional. The court argued that Congress had violated the separation of powers principle by trying to bypass a court decision with legislation. The law was amended to apply only to the federal government, which was then upheld by the court. Several states have now passed their own RIFRA laws. It is the state-level RIFRA laws that have been used in some states to deny services and rights to the LGBTQ community. Let's review. The founders argued that freedom of religion is valuable because linking religion and government threatens all individual freedom. The Establishment Clause states that the federal government will not support an official state church. In the conflict between accommodationist and separationist views of the Establishment Clause, 
The Supreme Court generally has leaned towards separation with occasional nods to accommodation. The Free Exercise Clause promises that citizens can participate in the religious activities of their choice. But when these activities interfere with social order, individuals must show that their religious liberties have been unfairly infringed by the state.